I mean, it's a flat, desert-looking place. So she had this association with this place and with this fear, and nothing they had done. They tried drugs, they tried all kinds of therapies of various kinds, and this guy, just this psychiatrist, had just taken the Psy-K class, uh, a weekend class, the one I'm teaching this weekend, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and so he... Uh, He's, he got to a place with her, he just said, look, I've tried everything else. I, I got to admit, I just went to this weekend workshop. I don't know if this will work or not, if it has anything to do with it. So he didn't really believe in it. And then she didn't believe in it because she said, well, how can something like this affect a biochemical disorder? I mean, it, how can it work? And they both said, well, what the heck, you know, we'll just give it a shot. They did. And that one session, that, that agoraphobia disappeared. That woman was out driving a car within a week going wherever she wants. She had relatives she hadn't seen in the area unless they came to her house because she couldn't leave her house for all of those years. So it's just, I mean, that was a wonderful story and an amazing testimonial to the fact that I don't care how long you've had something, boils down to photons of light held in an electromagnetic field and if you can find the address of that belief and you can rewrite that software, you can change the outcome. So keep that in mind when you're saying, oh, I've had that for a long time, that'll be a tough one. Not necessarily. Myth number two, changing old behaviors and thought patterns is difficult and often painful. This is the no pain, no gain myth. You've got to suffer, suffer, suffer first, and then you can change. Not so. Thought patterns and behaviors are caused by perception, beliefs. They're represented by specific configurations of photons of light, the energy we're talking about. Change the field, you change the belief. Change the belief, and you change the behavior and thought pattern. So it's all about how do you isolate the belief you want to change, how do you get the subconscious mind to do the work for you instead of making it so hard trying to do it consciously? We're going to be doing just that. Myth number three, you need to consciously know what caused the problem in order to change it. Well, if I don't know what caused it, how can I change it? That's the mantra of mainstream psychotherapy because they're having to change things by figuring out what it was, telling you what happened, giving you this powerful insight, and then making a huge assumption that insight is a sufficient condition to change. And that's what really turned me around after I got out of graduate school because I was sitting down doing that really well with people. We got real clear about why they were screwed up. <laughs> they knew, I knew, but they were still screwed up. <laughs> Unsatisfactory, unacceptable. You had to figure out a way to change that. How do you get to the behavior? Not just through this ton of awareness. I don't know about you, I'm up to my eyeballs and in insights. Spiritual insights, psychological insights, all these insights. And then you've got to wonder, well, why does my life look like all these wonderful insights I've got? I mean, true. So the reason is we have been talking to the wrong part of the mind most of the time. So becoming consciously aware of the source of the problem is seldom necessary to change most beliefs or behaviors when you're dealing with the subconscious mind. That's where the power is, that's where the juice is, that's where the storage unit is for your beliefs. It's not about willpower. Okay, let me give you an overview of the, of the process that I use, and this is um, basically the components of it, think of it that way, uh, to get the job done in terms of speeding up change, and literally it can happen in just a few minutes. Establishing communication with the subconscious is step one. I was never taught that in graduate school. In fact, I don't think they mention the subconscious except talking about Freud. And Freud, I mean, if you listen to Freud, the subconscious is a place nobody wants to go. I mean, talk about a deep, dark abyss of, uh, you know, repressed sexual desire. And you know the term Freudian slip? You know what that is? That's when you say one thing, but you mean your mother? Yeah. That'd be a Freudian slip. Okay. So nobody wants to go there because they've made it a horrible place to go. But the fact is, it's no more horrible than your hard drive. You go to your hard drive all the time. If you open your computer and you get documents out of there and stuff, that's energy. So we're going to be communicating with the hard drive here. You're going to pre-test a desired belief statement. That's a very important thing to find out if your subconscious believes it or not. Like uh, Juliana was very kind to come up here and, and, and uh, give her attention to this process. And I had her say something that was pretty non-threatening. You know, my name is Juliana. But what if I had said something like, had her say something like, I love myself unconditionally, or I trust that I am a, a, a wonderful person, or anything that she would desire to be and to know about herself. Then all of a sudden the rubber meets the road. Now you're finding out from your subconscious mind, do you agree with that statement or do you not? You may have done tons of therapy, you may have been saying affirmations and meditated for 25 years, and I tell you, <laughs> surprise, surprise, you know? You'll say something you think is true and you do believe it consciously, but your subconscious mind never got the message. And that's the part that really needs to get it in order to have behavioral change last. That's why so much change tends to be temporary and, and made out of lots of willpower.
All right, so we've got pretest the statement. Get permission and commitment to change the belief using a psyche balance. The balance processes that I use, I call them balances because essentially what they do is, is they create a balance identification or perception uh, of the left and right hemisphere of the brain at the same time for the new belief. And by doing that, using this whole brain integration process stuff, you can reduce the resistance to internalizing a new belief very quickly without all that effort and struggle. And the permission and commitment thing is really important. I, I've noticed in um, conferences I've attended uh, for energy psychology, as an example, uh, many of the processes make huge assumptions that if you have something that looks like it needs to be fixed, it actually represents something that's broken. I don't know about you, but a lot of times, whatever you call broken is a messenger. <laughs> you know, that message is there to, 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 that pain or difficulty or whatever you call dysfunction is there to teach you something, and you kill the messenger. So I found that it's much wiser to find out from the subconscious. It's even a good idea to do what you're talking about consciously before you do it. It saves you a lot of grief later on, and you don't have to get the proverbial two-by-four returning to get your attention because you managed to get a symptom to go away. This isn't about treating symptoms, it's about the cause of the symptoms. And then we'll do a balance, which is a, a, the process for change using whole brain integration of some kind or another, different, different varieties of that. We'll post-test the belief statement because it gives you a physical muscle response that's going to be different than in the beginning. So you have an objective way to measure a subjective change. You don't just say, well, how do you feel? And, well, fine, you know, you look good, uh, all right, see you next week. It's not that. You know before you leave the interaction whether that belief resides in your subconscious or not. So there's a way to know it for sure. And then celebrate the change, and that's my favorite part. So we'll be doing that. Okay. So, let's see. I want you to take a look at some of these messages. What I did was I distilled some of the key messages that over the years of doing psychotherapy, I found that many people internalize from their childhood. You'll never amount to anything. You're worthless. You're not smart enough. No matter how hard you try, it's never good enough. Money's hard to come by and hard to keep. You don't deserve to succeed. No one will ever love you. And Bruce's favorite, you're going to get cancer because it's genetic. <laughs> this one uh, at the bottom, of course, you can make uh, generic, which is uh, you're going to get whatever disease you're predisposed to because it, you, it's going to get passed along in your family. Uh, so it doesn't, it's, I'm just... I'm just putting it out there to let you know that it doesn't matter what disease you put in this category of cancer, it's the same notion that I'm helpless and the situation is hopeless. I'm just going to get what I'm getting passed along. So these may be some of the messages that uh, you got. And the question is, what if you could change them? What if you could have anything on this list? What if anything on this list could be true for you? What I'm going to ask next is, I'm going to ask somebody else to come back up to the stage and I'm going to facilitate a process, first of all, to discover whether the belief that seems desirable to you is currently true in your subconscious. And if it isn't, then I'm going to facilitate a process to make it so. It'll take just a few minutes to do that. And so what I'd like you to do is just read down this list. And if one of these beliefs calls to you and just says, boy, I want that, it may not be true right now. I'm not sure, but I'd be willing to come up here to make sure would you like, you have one? Okay. Come on up. Definitely. Yeah. I get this one. I might actually be able to finish my PhD. And which is that? I deserve happiness and success in my life. I deserve happiness and success. And your name is? Karen. Karen. Okay. Karen, I'm going to have you come over here, please. Mm -hmm. Like about so. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have you put your arm out. We're going to do a little muscle testing together. Can I have you turn this way just a bit? Mm -hmm. Thank you. With your uh, chin parallel to the ground, your eyes focused down and open. Mm -hmm. I'm going to press down on your arm. I want you to be strong if you can. You ready? Okay. Be strong. Okay. So we're going to do what we did initially to establish communication because I can't yet, I haven't gotten a weak signal, so I don't know what that's like in Karen's system. So I want you to say out loud, my name is Karen. My name is Karen. Be strong, Karen. Good. Say, my name is uh, Frank. Be a guy named Frank. My name is Frank. Strong, Frank. Okay, can you feel a difference in that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not pressing hard. I don't want to press hard. I'm not trying to make this dramatic. I'm just trying to press hard enough that she can tell when the muscle locks in place and when it unlocks. So we're getting a very clear signal here. Just for fun, I want you to do in your mind silently repeat the word yes. Hear that over and over in your head. And be strong as I press. Okay, repeat the word no over and over. And again, be strong as I press. Good, you feel the difference? Yeah, pretty, pretty, yeah big difference. Okay. Yeah.